All right. Sorry, I was just sending somebody the Zoom link. <laughs> How are you doing? I'm doing good. Oh, good. It's so good to see you. You too. <laughs> yes. Teaching going well? It's going. <laughs> I'm, yeah, yeah. It's going in all kinds of different directions. Exactly. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Just trying to keep my head on straight. Exactly. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, we, I guess it is 7.02, but we have some more maybe coming on. So we'll just. We also have YouTube and. Yeah. And Facebook. So we're going to get started here in a little bit. Just want to welcome everybody. I'm so glad to see everybody. I'm so glad to be trying this and we'll see how I do at it. <laughs> but I like having people in person. This is a little odd for me. Um, but we're gonna be talking about empowered and equipped parents and building a relationship with our children to know God. So it's all about those relationships and how important they are. So we'll be talking about that today. There's Mr. Summers coming on. Hi, Ryan. Hey, what's up, guys? How you doing? Hey, we doing good. How about you? I'm all right. I'm all right. I'm all right. It's good to see that smile. Yes. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Good to see yeah. you guys. I'm excited for you this evening. Good. Mr. Summer, good to see hey. you, brother. What's up, man? <laughs> Hello. So I'm going to be here. I'm looking forward to this tremendous series that we're going to have talking about parenting. Amen. Hey, thanks. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, let's open up with some prayer. I guess it's okay to start. I think we have a good group here. Mike's shaking his head. Yes, he's going to keep me on track. Um, but we'll let's good luck. 40, almost 42 years and he still hasn't kept me on track very well sometimes. <laughs> but we're going to open up in prayer. So if you would join me. Dear Heavenly Father, we just thank you for this great opportunity that you have given us. We thank you for those that have joined us. God, we praise you and thank you for everything that you've done. We thank you for your Holy Spirit and his guidance through these difficult times. God, I pray that you would intervene today. God, I pray that your spirit would speak through us and touch us, open our hearts and minds to receive what you have for us today. God, as we talk to the parents about equipping and building the relationships with our children, God, I pray that peace would come upon them. And God, I just pray that you would open up your word and help us as we delve into it and guide us and direct us every day in this parenting job that we have. And God, I just ask for your Holy Spirit to go before us. And we ask in Jesus' name, amen. So we're going to open up. I'm going to share my slides, hopefully. See if I can work this. My daughter tried to walk me through it. So, Mike, do you remember where I can find it? Huh? Down at the bottom? Yeah, I hit that, but I'm not seeing my slides. Do I have to open up my PowerPoint? Yeah, I'll, I'll come over. <laughs> There, I got it, I think. I think, but when I do this, when I go to open this, do I go to that? Yeah. Okay. And then you can minimize. Um, you can minimize it in there. Okay. All right, so we're gonna be talking about empowered and equipped parents and building a relationship with our children to know God. Because it's really important about uh, that our kids know who God is. And how do I get that back up? I can't do this. <laughs> okay. Sorry, I'm trying to figure this out. I'm new at this. So anyway, most of us either have kids at home or have had kids at home at one point. Um, we're in the position where we have eight grandchildren, all grown kids. But 
we still need to be able to guide and direct and to build those relationships. Our relationships with our children just change over the years, depending what age they're at. Um, adult relationships with your children, I have found to be sweet. You know, you've, you've gotten to that point where you have spent a lot of time with them and that you know them so well and they know you. And it's just a good time to be able to be together. So in this, we're gonna be, we're gonna try to stay the course and we're gonna try to stay positive because our children need to know us. Um, flip my slide. So I'm gonna talk about, and this came from a seminar that I went to when I was in children's ministry. And this gentleman spoke and spoke to, to us about children being arrows. And I've always heard this verse, but I have just guess I never really paid much attention to it as far as the way he delivered it. Like arrows, Mike, can you read this for us? Sure. Like arrows in the hands of a warrior, so are the sons born in one's youth. Blessed is the man whose quiver is full of them. They will not be put to shame when they contend with their enemies in the gate. So in this verse, it talks about children being arrows. A lot of time when you read this verse, people think, not in this verse so much, but a lot of times when you hear people talk, you would think that children were more of a liability than they were a blessing. And in this verse, God is telling us that the children are a blessing. There's something that shows that if your quiver is full, you're very blessed. And rather than a liability, they are an asset. The Bible calls children a heritage from the Lord, a reward. Sometimes we don't always feel they're a reward when we're having those trying moments, but they are a reward. And maybe those challenges are meant to sharpen our edges. Um, they are an opportunity to shape our future because God values them highly. So when we're shaping our children, we're shaping our future too, because those children are going to go on to be leaders in this world. And boy, do we need them now. Um, does anybody know what a definite, the definition of an arrow is or how would you describe an arrow? Anybody want to unmute and tell us, share? I'm going to call my husband if nobody else does. <laughs> Go ahead, Michael. Okay, well, this is just one definition. Okay. An arrow, a missile shot from a bow and usually having a slender shaft, a pointed head, and feathers at the butt. In ancient times, they were the main long distance weapon. Somebody go on? No, that's fine. Um, okay. Thank you though. So when you think of an arrow, we, all, we often think of it as a weapon. And when in the ancient times, when they made these arrows, the craftsmen, they weren't made in a factory. Like now you can go and buy a bunch of arrows and they're all perfectly made and they shoot perfectly maybe because they're so straight by the machines. But in the ancient times, the warriors or the, the crafters would craft the arrows so well that they knew them so well. They would study them so well. They knew them intimately. They knew how the arrow would shoot. They knew where to aim it or how to aim it. And so when they did this, they took great pride in it. So if you think about our children, we are crafting them and we are helping them to become those straight arrows, to be able to hit their mark. We want them to be able to go out into the world and to be able to hit the mark that God has called them to hit. So we need to know our children well. We need to know their gifts because each one of them has a gift. If you have more than one child, you know that they're all different and that they all are able to do different things well. And they all have those strong points just like we as the body of Christ do. Well, when, so we need to get to know our children well. We need to build up those relationships with them and spend time with them and get to know them. 
Um, in lo a long time ago, when they went to war, when you think about the arrows, what they were used for, they were used so that they could hit their enemies from afar off so that it would lessen the chances of them having to do hand-to-hand -hand battle. So when they would shoot those arrows at the enemies far off and be killing off their enemies or defeating them, they wouldn't have to do as much hand-to-hand -hand battle. So when we're preparing our children for what is coming, we're preparing them so they, they don't have to do as much hand-to-hand -hand battle. It eliminates a lot of the close-up battles that they would have to do. And it could alter the course of a battle by those, if they, the sharpshooters hit, were able to hit their marks with the arrows. So it could alter the course. And just like the arrow doesn't do any good if it's left in the quiver, neither will our children if we don't release them to impact the world. So at some point we need to get them ready and release them to be an impact in this world. And so we wanna be the ones that help to get them as parents, as caregivers, maybe you're a grandparent caring for children, or maybe right now with the COVID situation, maybe you have them at home and you're trying to get them through their schoolwork. As parents, you might be doing that a lot. You've become both the teacher and the parent. And these times are hard and they call for a lot of patience and um, being able to be on the spot and being able to come up with solutions. So if we don't release them, they won't make that impact. We've got to get them ready and we have to release them. So children should be prepared to hit the mark, to fly straight and to stop the enemy. So that's what we're trying to do. So that, I just wanted to open it up, getting you to think about children and think about how much of a blessing they are. And a lot of times we feel like they're, I know we're tired and we have a lot of work to do and we get very overwhelmed sometimes. And in this time where you're trying to do two jobs and I know a lot of my teacher friends that have small children at home and they're both doing their job as teaching but yet also trying to guide their children in their virtual learning. And I know it's tough and it's hard and I hear the hearts of parents that are doing this too. So we just need to be ready and just know that your children are a heritage of God. And so we have to set the tone. We have to set the tone in our household. So I'm gonna go back to my screen share, hopefully, and move on to the next slide. Atmosphere. We have to set the atmosphere in our home. When you think of a thermometer, versus a thermostat, think about the jobs that they do. Think about what one is used for as opposed to the other. And I have lost my, so I want you to think about those two things and let's talk about what the differences are, what a thermometer would be used for so does anybody want to share what their take on the thermometer versus the thermostat? Anyone? I don't want to ask my husband again. He's going to shoot me. <laughs> the thermometer can only measure its environment, and but it cannot have an effect on its environment, whereas the thermostat can. Very good. That was good. It cannot do anything. The thermostat just measures what's already there. It can't do anything to change it. But the thermostat, you set it where you want it. And if you think about that, if you set it, it regulates the temperature. It keeps it steady. So if you're a person that likes it cool, you can set it cool. If you're a person who gets cold really easy and you wanna be warm, then you can set it higher. But you set it where you're gonna be comfortable. And when you think about your family and everybody that lives under your roof, you're thinking about how can I set my environment or my thermostat to where everybody can be comfortable because we're all working together. So in that environment, we just need to think about 
how we want to set it, what your preference is and what your family's preference. So when we think about the home atmosphere, And I'm gonna ask Mike to read this verse. It's Galatians 5, 22 and 23. And most of us know this, but I want us to think about it as setting the atmosphere for our home. Okay, and this is from the New Living Translation. But the Holy Spirit produces this kind of fruit in our lives. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. So when we think about the atmosphere and we go back to think about the thermostat and how we want to set our home, I want us to think about this as an exercise that we can do. Um, you can set the atmosphere you want in your home and use Galatians as a guide to help you do that. What would happen if your home, if you think about it, if your home was set with an atmosphere of the fruit of the spirit, having the fruits of the spirit that everybody would self-regulate themselves, having the understanding that our home and what we expect in our home is to have patience, is to be kind and gentle and long suffering and have joy. When we think about those things, what would our home be like? Because I know, I, I know that we know the fruits of the spirit and we know that we should be displaying the fruits of the spirit. But have you ever thought about putting that on a piece of paper and in our home, and this is one of the the applications that have. our home will be a home full of and then together with your family members sitting down and saying which of these fruits do we want to see in our home and in each one of our lives all the time with how we respond to one another with how we share with one another and react to one another just think about what that would be like as adults we can self-regulate better children are still learning to do that. Um, our teens might be good at that for some of the times, but there might be moments when they don't. But if we had that posted and we started thinking about somebody getting angry and then we can point them back to saying, remember what we said our home was going to be like, is this displaying what we want to see in our home? One of our things that we chose was self-control are we showing self-control and if we're not how can we fix that because even as parents i know as a parent that there were times when the school had called and told me what my son had done and the trouble that he was in that i wasn't feeling working in education and being in the building i remember in the building that i was working in and being called to the principal's office because my son wasn't behaving well in the classroom because he attended the same school i did and it was hard to use self-control at that point but we all had those moments when our self-control is maybe out of control and so it's good to have those reminders posted and so that the whole family can be reminded. I mean, you could even post them in every person in the bedrooms of each family member or on the refrigerator door or someplace where you see it because we all need those reminders. And so when you think about the atmosphere, you can use the illustration of the thermostat and thermometer with your family and talk about the difference and talk about what do we want to see in our family? How do we want the atmosphere in our home to look? And using reading Galatians 5, 22 and, tw and 23, you could read that and say, which one of these would you like to see in our home more? I bet most kids would say joy. They would like to have joy in the home. And they said, well, well then you have to discuss, well, how are we going to get joy in our house? What's that going to look like? Because this could become a family devotion. It could be something that maybe takes 
isn't going to happen in one time when you sit down. It might be something you continuously discuss until together you develop this. Because we all know until you buy into something, you know, you can buy into it more if you're part of it, if you're part of developing it. And so we can all take a part in trying to develop that and being able to um, enjoy putting together it together as a family and knowing this is what you want. And so if everybody's had taken part in it, then when you direct them back to it, they will accept it more readily than if you just come down with a list of rules. This is what we're gonna follow. This is what we're gonna do. The kids understand better when they understand why we're doing it, what God's word says about it, and that we're all trying to do this because we lead by example, <laughs> definitely. So the Holy Spirit can help us. We have to join our lives to the spirit if we want the fruit of the spirit to be in us and to be seen by us. We have to join together with the spirit of God in order, and we have to know God intimately in order to display that to our children so that they have that to follow. So our thermostat needs to be working properly. We need to set our thermostat properly at the right temperature, because we all know if something is set too hot, as I'm getting red right now, because this happens when I talk. So right now I'd like to go turn my thermostat down and turn the air conditioning back on, but my husband would die. Um, so we all know that when we hit those temperatures that are so unbearable, when, they're, when you're too hot, you don't feel good. You don't like it. When you're too cold, you don't feel good. And it's the same thing when our kids, if we don't have the temperature regulated in our homes, it's uncomfortable. It's uncomfortable for everyone. So we have to make sure that our thermostat works, it's not broken, and that we have that connection so that we can set it right and set the temperature so that our home can be a place where the kids can feel free to share. If they feel uncomfortable in a situation or they feel, I, I remember my husband and I used to do this thing where if one of us, we felt one of us was too harsh on one of the kids and disciplining them. Now we never did it in front of the kids, but we would take each other aside and say, mm -hmm. you know, you were a little hard. Do you think that was okay? Or do you think you should maybe lower the, the, um, the consequences? And so we talk it over and if they felt that they were too harsh, then they would go to that child and say, hey, I was wrong. I was a little bit too hard on you. You know, let's decide what we're gonna do. But then that way it is good for the kids to see and that we can make mistakes too. And sometimes we're not perfect. But those are good examples for our kids and help us to build that relationship because there are times where we're just in, not in a good mood. We came home, my husband got an earful the other day. Sorry, Mike. Because my day at work at school was beyond hectic and there were a lot of things not going quite right. And it was just very hard. So I was a little bit on edge and came home and shared that very willingly with him. <laughs> so so um, he was my sounding board and some look at me shaking his head. Yes, he popped on for that. Um, what you basically did was come home and turn up the thermostat. I did. And so he had to help me to self-regulate so that I could get it fixed. So those, it happens. So we have to help our kids by showing them that we're vulnerable too. You know, things happen in our world that do get us off. But if we go back to God's word and we say, hey, so if we have this written down, almost like another class I taught, I said, make us, um, now I can't think what I want to say, make a mission statement for your family, work on it together and post it somewhere where you can all see what do you want for your family? So this is sort of like a mission statement. This is telling everybody in your family, this is what we want to see in our home. And that way, when they're, if they're doing this in your home and they're showing these things, when they go out into the world, they're going to do the same thing. They're going to share those same things. When they're in school, you know, um, they're going to help other kids, maybe, 
do the right thing or they they might help them. Hey, that was maybe I'm not a nice thing that you said to that little boy. Do you think we could fix it? They're going to be those peacemakers. They're going to be those people that go out and show kindness and things because this is the type, think about the type of leaders that we really want leading us and leading our country. So we want our kids to be those kind of people that we want to see leading our country. So we're going to help them to self-regulate, but first we got to make sure we're self-regulated and that our thermostat is working properly. So I lost my place. So anyway, application. What I want you to work on, one of the things we're good, I still have more to share, but one of the things I want you to do is to make a family atmosphere statement. I want you to say, um, our home will be filled with, and let me share my screen again. Family atmosphere, our home will be filled full of and complete that statement with your family. Use Galatians 5, 23 as a guide and then write them down and display them where all your family members can see it. You can use the illustration of the thermostat and the thermometer with your children and invite them to discuss the kind of atmosphere that they wanna see and then discuss what will that look like? How will we show that? Because we, this can help them then to begin to make an impact, not only in your home, but the world around them. Because we're show, shaping them to be released to hit the mark. Think of that arrow. We are shaping them to be able to be released into the world. And so by doing that, we wanna make sure that we are, like my fork, I bet you're wondering what that's for. Albert Einstein said, Exemplification is the greatest teacher. We have to nourish our spirit and our mind. And our children learn from watching us, even when we don't realize it. Even when we don't realize what, what, he, what we are doing is impacting our children. We've all had those toddlers that have mimicked everything we're doing. Um, when my kids were very tiny, they loved to clean. You know, if I was dusting, they wanted a dust rag. Rag. If I was sweeping, they wanted their little broom. They loved to help. When they got to be teenagers, not so much. But we know that kids will copy what they see. They will mimic what we do. And so we need to make sure if we're regulated right in our atmosphere and our home, and we're showing those fruits then that will be what our children copy. But if our home is filled with yelling, if it's filled with like, it's really hectic and we're on edge all the time, then that too will pass on to our children. So our relationship with our children, they will also see how important they are um, by the time that we spend with them, by the caring words that we say, by taking time to listen to their stories, no matter how many times they've told you or how silly it seems. Um, on the playground, I have children that come up to me all the time and tell me all kinds of different things. So be careful what your children see because they're gonna tell somebody somewhere because they like sharing things. I remember my son um, shared with this preschool teacher, although this was, did not happen, he told her that we were not, he was not eating at our house anymore because he was tired of the bugs that I fixed. I did not cook bugs, although he was a good storyteller and he did that many times. He's the same one that I went to the principal's office for. So we wanna make sure that what we are sharing with our children, what they're seeing in our homes, how they're seeing us interact with each other, that it's something we want them to also do. Because a lot of times the things that, if, if, because I can tell you if you're ye yelling and angry and you're that way all the time, your children will probably do that also. They're probably- we did, a, Gus, we did get a comment right along those lines that said children produce what they see. Absolutely. You know, the, we often say that statement, the fruit didn't fall far from the tree. You know, when, when you see kids and you see how they act or what they do, we often use it because my daughter will say she put, 
she put a statement. She had a thing hanging in her bathroom that said mirror, mirror on the wall. I am my mother after all, because, you know, as much as sometimes we say, I'm never going to do that. You know, sometimes they do, but we want our children to say, Instead of saying, my parents showed me what I don't want to do, we want our children when they grow up to say, my parents lived the kind of life that I want to live. We want them to say those type of things. We never want them to say, well, this is what my mom did and I'm never going to do that. Um, although there are those sayings that I said I would never say, like, don't run with that stick, you're going to poke your eye out. Yeah, I said them. So anyway, sometimes we do, but we want to be live a life the way we want our kids to live it. We want to be that example that we want them to show them the way we want them to live. And what we want, when we look, if we could look into the future and see our children in their adult life and see them living out their life, what would you want it to look like? How would you want them to act? So that arrow that you have in your quiver, you need to make sure that it's straight and ready to fly. You need to make sure that it's gonna hit the mark that you want it to hit, that bullseye that you're shooting for. You wanna make sure that they can get there. And our job is to guide them and to direct them. Our job is to help them become that person that God wants them to, to be because they are a gift from God. They're not ours for a very long time, but they are a gift from God that he has entrusted us with. And he's saying to us, I'm giving you this gift. Now, what are you going to do with it? You know, cherish it, hold it, keep it, keep it safe. We can't shelter our children from the world, but we can insulate our children so that they can withstand all those elements that are outside in the world. So our job is not to isolate them, it's to insulate them. It's to get them with that word of God and insulate them so well that they will be able to go out into the world and do what God wants them to do. They also need to feel safe in this environment that they can share with us the problems that they're having. We want them to be able to feel comfortable to come to us and to be able to share those moments when maybe their thermostat wasn't working that day. Maybe they had a bad incident at school or with a friend or with a sibling. They need to feel safe that they can come to us and admit that and say, I need help fixing this. Because sometimes we might say to them, hey, you know, mommy or daddy, we didn't act right today. And you might have teenagers, you might have grown children, because there, it wasn't too long ago that my one daughter, that I talked to her and, and apologized to her for something that happened when she was a child. But I felt that it was something that I needed to say to her for her to be able to heal from that. And so sometimes we need to do that. And it's okay. It doesn't make us a little person, but it shows them that I, you're willing to do that for them. So just like our bodies need proper nourishment, we have to help our children, but we have to be nourished also. So I showed you that picture of the fork because God said this, and I love this. When I heard the speaker talking about this, it just hit me in such a way. You know, you read these verses sometimes over and over again, but you don't really like think about everything that is meant behind them. It said in Psalms 23 and five, you prepare a table for me in the presence of my enemies. So as far as our children, we wanna make an impact in their lives. And just like our bodies need proper nourishment to stay healthy, so does our spirits and our mind. And what we feed on plays a major role in whether or not we will have the strength to be healthy parents the healthy parents that we want to be. So if we want to be that example, we need to make sure that we are feeding our mind and our spirit. And in this verse, when it talks about this, it just hit me so much. I mean, I, I hope I don't cry here, but I just thought about it because so many times we get so overwhelmed with all the things that come at us in the world, 
you know, all the negativity that we get faced with sometimes. Maybe a lot of people are losing jobs, um, people being sick, um, so much hatred that is going on right now that those things can affect us. But God said, and we have promises, and the thing I hold to is my hope is not in the things of this world or the people that are leading this world. It's in a higher power. And God is going to be the one that rules over all. And will every knee will bow. One day, every knee will bow. But we need to start looking when God says he prepares a table for me in the presence of my enemies. God is preparing a feast. In the presence of our enemies, he's preparing a feast. And so when we look at this feast, we need to start looking for it. When our enemies are around and everything and we're being attacked, look for the feast. Because God said, I prepare a feast for you in the presence of our enemies. So we got to get our fork and look for the feast. We have to find the table that is God, God has set out for us. Stop worrying about the enemy. Don't look for the enemy, but look for the feast. No need to take a fighting stance, but instead take a seat and rest. Take a seat at God's table and rest. And in this whole thing with trying to parent in the situations that we're in, just know that with all those enemies and when our kids see us being at peace and that we're taking and we're saying, God just set a feast in front of us. Our enemies around, but God said, go to this verse in Psalms 23, five and say, he's preparing a table for me. He is ready to set out a banquet I'm going to get my fork and I'm going to sit down and I'm going to eat. And I hope there's a lot of chocolate there because I like chocolate. So I just want a big chocolate cake. Just put a chocolate cake there. I'll be okay. Chocolate pie, chocolate cake. My grandmother made the best chocolate pie. I haven't been able to repeat it because she couldn't read or write, but she could bake and cook. So I didn't have, she never had a recipe. She just did it. And so we're going to find the table. We're not going to take a fighting stance. We're going to take a seat and rest. We're going to get our fork ready and we're going to eat. And we're going to show our children how to sit at God's table. And we're going to lead by example. When our kids see us in the midst of all the troubles, taking that seat at God's table and getting out his word and feeding our spirits and showing them how no matter what's going on out there, God has an answer. God's got it. You know, we keep saying that and seeing that. Oh, God's got it. Well, he really does have it. And he doesn't just have it because Jesus already won the battle. I don't know why we're worrying about fighting. Our arrows that we're preparing, our kids, they are being prepared for victory. They're being prepared to be shot out and hit that mark that God has called them to hit. And that's what we're going to be doing. We're going to be leading them. We're going to set the atmosphere. We're going to work on that this week that we sit down with our family, no matter who is your family. Maybe you're just all alone. Maybe it's just you. I mean, it's just my husband and I, but we're, we're going to, we like those mission statements. We like saying, this is what we're going to have in our house. I mean, I remember when our kids grew up, we didn't say shut up and I wouldn't let them say fart. I didn't like it. So I didn't think it was polite. You just said it. I just said it. I know, but we didn't say shut up. And so if anybody makes that mistake, everybody says, oh, we don't say shut up in this family. But wouldn't it be great if our kids say, oh, in our family, we have joy. We have peace. We have long suffering. That's what our family has. We have kindness and goodness. That is what we want them to say about our family. And so that we're going to lead by example. We're going to show them how to sit down at God's table and pick up the fork and rest in the midst of everything. Mike, did you have okay. anything? Yes, I do. Um, talking about leading by example, we have a request okay. for you to provide some examples on how a parent can, what they can do to nourish themselves. So, so they can be well enough to again, nourish the children. Right. Well, one of the important things is we all need to take time to ourselves. And I know sometime when 
during COVID and everything, it's hard to get those precious moments by yourself. Um, I know some of the ways that when my kids were all home, we, my husband and I tried to give each other the time or, but I always took time out for a devotion. Sometimes I would get up early in the morning and I would get my Bible and read with my cup of coffee and read my devotion and say a word of prayer. And I know now I still need to, I mean, we all, we never stop needing to nourish ourselves. Um, there have been times when, when I was doing children's ministry that I had to get away. And I just wanted a little cabin in the woods with no television, no anything. I just wanted me and the Bible and God. That's all I wanted. I just wanted to be up there and just spend time. So I know it's hard for parents right now to find those times. It might, could be in a car ride when you're going to the grocery store, if you don't have your children, that you just hit, if you have the Bible app, you can hit the, um, it can read to you. Finding the quiet times to pray. I get to work early in the morning and sometimes I walk the track at our school and listen to the word of God as I'm walking the track and walk, or and sometimes I walk around our, our school building because I'm back in the, and I pray for our school and our people and everything and the kids that are gonna be entering in. So sometimes we need to take the time. We need to make the time. If you say, I need to find time, we'll never find it. But you have to come up with and make a time, whether it's early in the morning or after the kids are in bed, that you at least spend some time in God's word and not just read it, but meditate on it. And maybe it's just one verse and studying on that verse and thinking, how does this verse speak to me? And because sometimes, like we just read in the, um, the one I just read about the feast, I mean, sometimes we just read through that and say, oh, God's going to prepare a feast. Well, he's already prepared it. And so every time we have those enemies, you know, when it hit me and that guy said, get your fork ready, that just struck me in such a new way. And so sometimes it's little moments like that, but prayer can be in small moments. You don't have to always be on your knees in a closet praying. You can pray in your car as you're driving. You can pray when you lay your head down on the bed. You can pray when you're at work. Well, I pray at work a lot, um, just silently to myself, just when I'm getting ready to do a new task with a student or maybe a student because I work in special education and some of the students that I have have a really hard time. Um, some of mine are behavior kids and autistic kids and they have, they struggle. And so sometimes I need to make sure I'm ready. So prayer is a way of bringing peace and peace to my soul, but just pray to God and ask him to really help you with that and to really make a time. Sometimes if you're new at this, you might wanna get a devotional book that helps and guides you into things, but there's different ways. And if you find a partner, maybe somebody to keep you accountable for those times to be able to nourish yourself so that you can be nourished to, and be healthy spiritually for your family. And just remember, even if you're going to church or if you're watching church online, just to make sure you're in tune with it. And maybe you can use what the pastor's preaching or a verse that he's used to go on and do a further study on it too. Did that answer well enough, Mike? Did you have anything to add? Um, that was a great answer. You've got some amens and wonderful message and things like that as okay. comments, but I would like to add um, just one more thing. One of the things I always like to share about prayer is sometimes when we pray, it's supposed to be a conversation with God and we forget that. And we start, we start talking to God. We open up the ball of wax. We tell God what we need, what's going on, what, what the problem is, what we need help with. And then when we say amen, we sign off and we never let God talk to us. So part of the prayer is allowing God the time to talk back to us. We need to reflect on what he says. As you said, you mentioned Bible reading, you mentioned prayer and meditation, and you mentioned someone else to keep you accountable. Those are all great. And if you're married, you need to 
take some time with your spouse, what Beth and I call couch time, when the, you just tell the kids, we need 10 minutes alone, you guys go be busy or go to bed, do something, but we need just a few minutes together just for us because the most important relationship in the household is the marriage relationship before you can be a good parent. And then I'll stop because I could keep going too. He will be teaching on that later. <laughs> just not today, but um, so it is, 747 so we have like 10 minutes so I want to give you another thing to do at home to try when we're talking about the verse that I just read and that God prepares a feast God said trust in the Lord and do good I'm going to try to share my screen again um so trust in the Lord and do good dwell in the land and feed on faithfulness. There's that fork again, get it ready. You're not gonna feed on junk food. You're gonna feed on faithfulness. This week, I'd want you to share with your family during your family times, during your, I'm sorry, share with your family times that you have experienced God's faithfulness in your life. You could, if you have younger children, teenagers might not like this. They might think it's stupid. But maybe if you have younger kids, you could take a paper plate and write some things down on the paper plate that show times that God has, you have experienced his faithfulness. Because those things, one thing I want you to know is that when David was talking in this verse, he's telling us to take delight in the Lord and to commit all we have and do to him. So everything we have and everything we do needs to be committed to God. We must know him better in order to experience the joy. And if we don't know him, we cannot impart the knowledge of him to our children. We have to know him. We have to know him well in order to experience the joy. And let me tell you, Children love joy. Children are the happiest when they can experience joy. When you see a kid with, that has just been elated with joy and their face and how excited they get, and you think about those things, that that's what we want to see in them. That's how joyful we want them to see, to see them about God's faithfulness. We want them to have that kind of joy when they think about the things God has done for them. So it's very important that you share your story with your kids. And as I, this is a quote from John Westerhoff. It says, at the heart of our Christian faith is a story. And unless the story is known, understood, owned, and lived, we and our children will not have Christian faith. We have to know our story and our kids need to know our story. In another parenting class that I taught, I said it is important to know God's story because God's story didn't end with the end of the Bible. God's story is still going on. God's story is being completed in the things that we do. When we share God's, when we share God's story and what God's done in our life, we have continued God's story because he's not done with us. He's not done writing his story because we're all a part of it. And so we need our children to understand that we are part of God's story and that everything that we do is done for him to glorify him. And so that hope that God gives us, you know, when children know the story, they will understand better God's faithfulness. When they see what God has done in your life and the things he's brought you through and the things he's helped you with, then they will better understand that when they're having a hard time, they can look to God to help them. We're leading by that example. And so to know him and impart that knowledge to him and that gift of hope. So if so this week when you're doing that, read that verse together with them. Trust in the Lord and do good. 
dwell in the land and feed on God's faithfulness. What does that mean to feed on God's faithfulness? You know, we need to get our fork ready. He's, he's prepared a feast in front of our enemies. And now he's told us feed on his faithfulness. That means we're going to nourish our body with God's faithfulness. We are going to consume God's faithfulness. Um, when we can, you know, they always said you are what you eat. So our spirit is what we eat, what we put into it. So we want to make sure that we're able to do that. And so read the verse together and explain to them what it means to have faith in God for everything, for our lives, for our families, for our jobs and our possessions. We have faith that God will take care of us. And have you ever had a moment where you were really going through a hard time and maybe it was a coworker, maybe somebody in your life and they said, I don't know how you can keep going with what you've gone through. And they look at you and say, I don't know how you keep going, but we know and we can say that's God because I know that God's taking care of me because out of everything else, no matter what happens here on this earth, just like Job, if all our possessions are gone, if everything is taken from us, we still have God because the one thing the devil can't take from us is that relationship that we have with God. When we accept him as our savior, our life here might end, but they can't take that away because we have Jesus. And the one thing that I know for sure when my life is ended, that I have that hope of having eternal life with him. And really this stuff that everything here is just temporary and, and it goes by, take it from me, it goes by really quickly. And before you know it, your children are grown and they're out of the house and you don't have that time. So cherish every moment and just count up your joy and let the kids see your joy. Let them see that what God is doing, and it's okay when you go through a hard time if you cry, but it, but let them know that, but I know God's got this. I know God's going to take care of me no matter what I'm going through. And showing them that kind of faith. I remember my niece, when I grew up, I didn't grow up in a Christian home. I always said when Mike and I got together, he was Catholic and I was heathen. So I didn't grow up with that example in my home. But I had a niece that had a grandmother that took her to church all the time. And she just always had this peace about her. There was something different about her. And I always thought, whatever she's got, that's what I want. And so I always think that's what I want my kids to say. I want them to say, whatever she, mom's got, that's what I want. Whatever dad's got, that's what I want. Because those are the things we want. And those are the things we need to hold on to. And knowing that no matter how bad it gets, just knowing God, having faith in God, he's going to get us through. No matter how bad it's gone, even when we lose everything here. And so I always like having an accountability, I can't talk tonight, accountability partner, somebody that can help keep me on track. Like for me right now, Mike's probably my biggest accountability because he, he doesn't mind telling me when I'm off track. And the same goes for me with him. But I've often had somebody at work that I found that is also spiritual because I'm in a secular school and there's some things you can't do or can't talk about. So I like having somebody at work that I know is a sister or brother in Christ that I can go to and that we can talk about these spiritual things because isn't it uplifting when you can talk about these spiritual things with somebody somebody that you can connect with, somebody that you can share with. So maybe there's parents. Now, I always say, don't get a grumbling session going because sometimes you can find somebody that's like-minded. And if you're complaining about somebody, you can find somebody that will complain with you. Don't do that. Find somebody that's going to lift you up and encourage you to do better. That's what we need in our lives. We need somebody that is going to help us to be a better person, better spiritually, better parent, whatever it is, find a mentor in your life, find somebody that can help you that you can look up to, because we all need those. I can think about mentors that I had at different times in my life. Right now, you're your children's mentor. You're helping them 
And so that relationship you have with your child is very important. They need to know that when they come home, they have a soft place to land. They have somebody that's gonna love them no matter what, even when they make mistakes. So we need to make sure that we're there for them and that we teach, him, teach them these fundamental things about God. The last verse I'm gonna leave you with is Proverbs 3, 5. And it says, trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. And it goes on to say, acknowledge him in all your ways and he will make your path straight. We need to set these kids on the right path. We need to help these arrows find their target. You are blessed if you have children. Count your blessings. Just know that there are hard times and parenting is not an easy job. I raised four children. Um, my youngest, um, the son that we prayed really for, we had three girls and one boy and we really prayed for this boy was probably the one that God was sitting back going, uh-huh, you asked for it, now you got it. We got it all right. And so probably if we got tried in many directions, but I look at him and see the spirit and God's still working on him. He is now 29 years old, but he's kind of gone away from the Lord, but I know that he knows. And sometimes all you have left is to pray. And so you get on your knees and you pray and you hold them close and you keep them and you never give up on them because trust me, God didn't give up on me, you know, and I wasn't always a Christian. I wasn't raised in a Christian home. I got saved when my oldest daughter was one. And so I thank God for that. I look back and say, there's a time when God was faithful. He saved me before I could damage my children too much. <laughs> so, so it was kind of nice being able to raise my kid in a Christian environment. Um, so, and my two oldest children are serving the Lord. My third daughter, um, she just, God is doing a work in her life and we see him bringing her around and she just got married and found a lovely man. And so I thank God for that and praise God for all he's doing in her life. So we praise God in everything and we thank God. It's not always easy. And our children don't always do what we want, but you think about your God's child. Do you always do what God wants you to do? So just think, give everybody grace. This is a time that we all need grace and we need to show grace. And so give that gift of grace to your kids. So next week we'll continue on a path with our arrows. Um, but I really enjoyed having everybody. Does anybody have any questions or comments or anything that they would like to say? Michael? Well, I'll just mention that you got a very nice, nice thank you from our oldest daughter in the chat. Um, so you'll appreciate that. But I wanna encourage everyone, uh, if you want to unmute and ask a question, just go ahead and do so. Or if you got comments, or anything you have to add or experiences you'd like to share. Hey, Sister Beth, uh, Ryan, yes. uh, I just want to applaud you. Um, you did a great job. Oh, God, I love yeah. you, Ryan. Um, and Your now, check's in the mail. <laughs> I, uh, but it was definitely just, just a blessing to hear, hear both of you. Hear a little bit from Mike, but hear a lot from you. Um, and, and really enjoyed that. Um, I think one of the things that really uh, connected with me was just the first part. Um, I don't have any kids yet, but just talking about the arrows and being able to hit things from afar. Um, and, and so many times, you know, with parents, you know, we have our own issues and problems, you know, and it's just like your kids, it's just like you want things to be better for them. Right. Um, so many times we got to do the, you know, the heavy lifting um, so you make things better for them. But again, they get to see um, that you're still working through things yourself. So just just the comments you made about just being keeping it real and being honest. Like, oh, no, nah, I think I'm kind of sorry for what I said. <laughs> um, it was just really important. So I just, my, my hat's off to you guys, but just thank you for that that wisdom um, of, of just being just open-hearted um, and being willing to be vulnerable uh, with your, you know, with your spouse, you know, with your children, um, because that's what we're here to do. Thank you, Ryan. Thank you. I appreciate that. Yeah. 
Anybody else? I don't want to cut anybody off if they have something they want to share. I um, I want to thank you for, well, I want to thank Mike for inviting me. I Aww. have Mike here with me as well, but um, a lot of the things you said have really touched uh, me and made me think. Um, I, I pray, but um, I haven't gone to church in, I think, a couple of years now, and um, you know, I have teenagers, and there's a lot of things going on, and when you said that, um, you know, our kids, and I'm not saying it word by word, but from what I understood that you said, you know, the kids are, are watching me, and, you know, they're going to, what is it, the apple doesn't fall that far from the tree, it just got me thinking, and I'm going to do a lot of, you know, meditation this week to see what I can change so that the kids can maybe, you know, do things differently. But um, I want to thank you for um, inviting us. So this was really good. Thank you, Mary Ellen. It's nice to meet you. <laughs> nice to meet you. <laughs> yes. Nice to see your mom, too. Yeah. yeah. Hello. Nice Hello. To meet you. <laughs> Hi. So I'm glad that helped. And yeah, it's, it's a time. Sometimes our children, even with everything that we do do, sometimes they still go off on their own way and do their own thing. But the best thing that we can do for them and the first place we need to start is with ourselves. It's, it always starts here, you know, and getting our heart right and prepared with God so that we can do better. So he's always the guiding force, but we can't fix any of these relationships unless this one's right. So thank you for that, Mariella. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> Okay. Well, if that's all that we have. You do have a uh, comment in the chat. It says, thank you for reminding us to set the temperature and to keep the temperature in check. Thank you for keeping up with those chats. <laughs> I can't do too many things at one time. <laughs> I, I just saw that there's chats down there. So anyway, <laughs> so, <laughs> don't laugh at me, Ryan. But thank you. So, sorry, let me hear. So, anything? Do you want to go back over anything or any questions about? So, everybody knows what their homework is, right? Everybody's going to set their atmosphere for their home this week. And they are going to share their story about how God's been faithful in their life with their children. So those are important things to do because our story, our kids' story, when you think about going back and studying your ancestry, you know, and you, everybody's wanting to find out where they came from now. I'm not sure I do. But anyway, but when you go back and you study that, you know, where you came from and things, people want to know that. So our kids, isn't it more important to know where God brought us from? and how we got to where we were. If, when I tell my kids my story, I was sitting in a place where I was never gonna work because my mother was a seamstress in a sewing factory and she used to always make me sew. I hated sewing. So I was never, guess where I ended up working? God took me right to a sewing factory to work and set me right beside this little Christian lady. And he sat me there and they were talking about something, I don't even remember what it was, the end of the world, I don't know. And I know I made a statement that said, well, when I die, it's up to God where I go. And this little Christian lady sitting right here said, oh no, it's up to you if you go to heaven. She set me straight. She said, and then she shared the story, invited me to church. I was in church the next Sunday and I've been in church ever since. And then I invited Mike, this little, dear little Catholic boy who thought I was crazy because it was a Pentecostal church. So you take a Catholic boy and put him in a Pentecostal church. But when God got a hold of that Catholic boy, let me tell you, he did a work. So when we're able to share that story and how God, you know, it, the way God works in mysterious ways, right? Sometimes where he brings us from, when I look back, 
When I look back at my teenage years, sometimes I wonder how I'm still living. So when my kids would try things, I go, mm, I ain't going to work. Been there, done that. No, you know. But sometimes our experiences and what we go through bring us to a place where we can help someone else get through theirs. I always say God brings us through so that people can see what he did. It's not about what we did. It's about what God did. And when we share that and we can share that with others, and then it might give them hope. So that's what we want to do. We're all about giving people hope and sharing the love of Jesus and that there's nothing, you know, God brought me out of so many things. And so for me to, to say to anybody, well, they're never going to be, you know, saved or that's, that isn't, I, you just need to love on everybody. We just need to share God's love and we need to pray for people. And the Bible always tells us, I used to tell my kids, you pray for your enemies. You pray for them. God might open a door to help so that you can lead them to Christ. Just pray for them and pray for that opportunity. And it's hard to be mad at somebody you're praying for. So that helps. But I'm going to ask if my husband made it back downstairs. We're chasing dogs around the house. So if is there anybody else that has anything that they would like to share? We don't want, I don't want to cut anybody short. We have sure. another, another great comment. God bless you. It's never too late. I didn't find Jesus until I was in my 40s. See, you know, never too late. Never too late. I remember walking with Mike's father and mother down to the altar at, at our church when we had um, a Christmas play and they went to the altar and accepted Jesus. And they were probably what in their seventies, Mike, at that time. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, you know, it's never too late. So if all hearts are clear and Everybody's had a chance to share that would like to share. We're going to end in prayer, but I hope you guys come back next week and look forward to new and great things. What you talking about next week? What? What are you huh? talking about next week? Aren't I coming back next week? Yeah. What, what, are, you, what are you talking about next oh, week? What I'm, I'm continuing on this. All right. Excellent. Excellent. So keep bringing your fork. There might be more food involved. Most definitely. I'm not hungry anymore. I'm good. Who's bringing, I want to know who's bringing snacks next week. All right. All right. Ryan, when you said that, I thought you were going to end up with Willis. What you talking about, Willis? <laughs> <laughs> okay. When you do come back next week, I'm speaking into existence. When you come back next week, feel more free to share things in the chat or because if, if, we will get you a chance to, to unmute and actually speak if you need to. Yeah. We want, she prefers, she talked a lot, but she, she and I both prefer a lot of interaction. So we'll do the best interacting we can through Zoom. All right. Okay, so I'll pray us out. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for your faithfulness. And we know that you are faithful always to us, God. You will never leave us nor forsake us. And God, as you have modeled for us the perfect parent, you have exemplified it for us. Help us to be that model that we need to be for our children. Help us to show them the right things to do. Help them to hear from us the right things to say. Help us to let them see our good and our bad when we've succeeded and when we failed. So they know that it's not perfection that we expect from them. It's the effort, Lord God, to always stay on the right path. Help them to be those straight arrows that as we prepare them and we equip them, then, then we release them into this world every day until they are adults and we release them for good, Lord. Help them to be able to fly straight and to hit the mark and to be able to do what they need to to defend their faith against the enemy so they can sit down and eat of that feast, Lord. We thank you for preparing that feast. We thank you for the, the all the message that we got tonight from Beth. That is part of the feast we can feed on right now, Lord. 
So we thank you that all of these people have been able to come together tonight to hear your word and how that word can impact us and therefore we can impact the world, especially through our children. We thank you so much, Lord God, for giving us a blessing. We thank you so much more, Lord, that you allow us to be a blessing. Give us that strength and encouragement to go out and be that blessing. And until we come together again, we give you the praise and the glory in the name of Jesus Christ. And everyone said, amen.